Um, and uh, welcome. Welcome to the uh, fourth and uh, final session of the Young Alumni Virtual Series. My name is Niven Miri. I'm the Alumni Relations Manager at PwC, and I will also be your program director for today's session. On behalf of the Director of Institutional Advancement, Professor Anesh Singh, um, welcome um, to the Chair of Council, uh, members of the UWC Executive Management, members of UWC staff, UWC students, and of course the UWC alumni community, as well as welcome to members of the broader university uh, community attending the um, session today. It is an absolute honor to, to, to host you today. And thank you very much for, for supporting the Alumni Relations Office and UWC um, on this Young Alumni Virtual Series um, initiative that has been spearheaded by the Alumni Relations team. Um, so from a contextual perspective, ladies and gentlemen, the, the series has been tailored for all our alumni as part of our ongoing commitment to offering you, our alumni, tangible benefits and real life value. But that said, the series has admittedly a bias toward our younger alumni communities as they na uh, navigate this ever-changing world. So topics that have been uh, discussed in the recent past um, include career guidance, entrepreneurship um, and, and innovation, um, as well as um, other soft skills that would enable our young alumni to navigate um, the world of work. But that said, ladies and gentlemen, today, today's session is applicable to each and every single one of us as part of the UWC community, but more importantly, as South Africans. Gender equity and access to a changing world of work is an aspect um, that forms part and, part, uh, part and parcel of the broader scourge that is plaguing our federal society, and that is of gender-based violence. I mean, I think in the recent few days, past week, we have witnessed some gruesome atrocities against our women, our mothers, our sisters, our daughters, grannies, nieces, aunties, and even our neighbors. And this today, ladies and gentlemen, is, is merely just one step in um, the direction that we as UWC um, we hope that we can start righting the wrongs, that we can start having the impact on, on our society and our communities um, in order to be able to heal and, and, and um, you know, affect in a positive manner our communities. But before we get started today, ladies and gentlemen, um, there are some very basic house rules um, for engagement um, that we request. And in order for the session to run as seamlessly as possible, that all attendees please adhere to the, to the house rules. Um, so first and foremost, the session will be recorded and broadcast live on Facebook. Um, and you know the, the recordings will be used for purposes none other than to further the Young Alumni Virtual Series. No information from the session will be disclosed to any third party. If you wish to uh, maintain your anonymity, please keep your camera turned off or even edit your identity. Also to ensure that the session runs on time and to ensure minimal disruptions, please ensure that your mic is muted and unless the moderator or myself, the host asks you un to unmute. If there are any breaks in transmission, please do reconnect immediately using the same link and you will be admitted immediately. Due to time, to, uh, time constraints, please lodge any questions in the chat box. Um, questions will be grouped according to relevance and importance, which will then be posed to the moderator. We will not be accepting any um, random questions from the, from, the, uh, from the audience. So please um, place everything in the, um, uh, in the chat box. If you feel that you must engage the panel, please use the raise hand function. Um, and then myself as the host, I uh, will um, use my discretion to allow or not. Um, ladies and gents, please uh, be advised non-adherence to the above very basic house rules or any disruptive behavior, um, you know, participants will be removed. 
So it gives me great pleasure um, to introduce Can everybody hear me? It's better now. All right. Um, so to, today it gives me great pleasure to introduce to you um, our phenomenal panel of, of speakers. Um, first and foremost, I would like to um, acknowledge um, the privilege that it is to have um, Professor Vivian Levac, who is a UWC executive member and Deputy Vice Chancellor of the Academic Port Portfolio, to serve as our moderator. Um, we are incredibly, uh, we are indebted to Professor Levac for, for, for availing herself to be with us today. Uh, Professor Levac, um, without going into any great detail, is Professor Levac holds a B Juris cum laude and an LLB cum laude and an LLM from Nelson Mandela University in Port Elizabeth. Um, she also holds a LLD um, from uh, UNISA. Um, she's an admitted non-practicing advocate of the High Court of South Africa. But um, Professor Levac, oddly enough, is, is not, as she says, not a a um, all out academic. Um, she began and advanced her legal career by spending a number of years at the South African Reserve Bank in various capacities. So uh, Professor Levac is and has a good understanding of both the academic as well as the corporate world. Um, secondly, we have um, UWC alumna, Ms. Lillian Barnard, who is the Ch Chief Executive Officer of Microsoft South Africa. Um, Lillian, thank you very much for, for, for joining us today. Um, Lillian joined Microsoft in May 2017 um, as the Public Sector Director for South Africa um, and a role that she almost held for two years. Um, and Lillian has more than 20 years worth of experience in the ICT industry. Um, you know, Lillian, I know, is, is incredibly... Um, uh, invested in, 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 in a, this topic and, and, and South Africa. And, um, you know, the, her positions have fitted perfectly to strengthen Microsoft com Microsoft's commitment to South Africa as it wishes to, you know, to drive its digital transformation ambitions and empower governments, organizations, and individuals to achieve a lot more. Secondly, we have another UWC alumna, um, Ilam Grunewald, who is the Chief Director of Marty Sport, if you don't know, that is the Stellenbosch University. Um, and, um, you know, Ilam is not only just the Chief Director of Marty Sport, but she's also an Executive Board Member, um, Council Member for South African Rugby. And she also occupies a few representative roles within the high education sporting environment. So. Um, Ilam is certainly, you know, breaking down um, stereotypes that have been pervasive within the, uh, the sporting culture within South Africa. Then we have um, Ms. Tracy Ashington. Um, Tracy is um, a career coach, student advisor, mentor, career strategist, and grad recruitment specialist. And Tracy has 22 years um, of matching smart people with awesome careers. And I think that says a lot. She's incredibly passionate about talent and uh, her perfect and they would include career coaching, creating career strategies, building, um, you know, brand building workshops, CV and interview guidance. So again, you know, you know, Tracy's, Tracy's um, participation in today's session is imperative as we plot out um, how we can, um, as UWC, um, assist our young alumni in, 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 in engaging this new world of work. And then finally, we have Ms. Nic Nicolette Naylor, and again, absolutely honored um, to have another female alumna um, as part of our panel. Um, Nicolette um, is a human rights lawyer. Um, I, I regress. She is the International Program Director uh, for Gender, Racial, and Ethnic Justice at the Ford Foundation. 
Um, and yes, Nicolette is a human rights lawyer um, who has completed two degrees, nonetheless, at the University of the Western Cape, yes, and then an LLM in International Human Rights at University College of London. Um, you know, in, two, in January 2019, Nicolette assumed the role of International Program Director uh, for Gender, Racial and Ethnic Justice that is responsible for, for directing the Ford Foundation's global programming on gender and racial justice with specific focus on gender-based violence. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, with that said, um, I would also like to express my sincere thanks to each and every single one of the speakers here today. I would also like to acknowledge my team, the uh, alumni relations team for all their hard work that has gone into to prepare today's session. And I sincerely do hope that you as our attendees will derive um, you know, a lot of value um, out of, from today's session. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to um, introduce Professor Levac uh, to conduct our opening remarks. Prof? Thank you very much, Nerva, and thank you very much for inviting me to moderate the last in the, the webinar series for young women alumni. Um, when Nervin spoke to me um, about the possibility of, of being involved with the um, webinar series, I was very pleased that it was focusing on young women alumni because I've run a, a series of courageous conversations with alumni and uh, this is taking it in a sense further. Um, oftentimes when, when we looked at the, the theme of the day around gender equity and access in a changing world of work, we oftentimes speak about gender equity or gender um, equality or issues relating to gender inequality during Women's Month, as we should. However, I believe that gender equity is not only a women's issue. And as I scan through, it's a societal issue as, as Levin also mentioned, as I scan through the list of participants, I find it very pleasing that we're not doing an all women, we're doing all women panel, but we have male participants as well. Um, I like what my, Maya Angelou said about gender equality and, and I quote, how important it is for us to recognize and celebrate our heroes and sheroes. Today is such an occasion for us. I initially wanted to quote statistics on gender gap, but I thought we did that last week at the separate, at the different uh, webinar, but I thought not to do it today. We just have to pause for a moment to think of the horrendous death of a fourth year law student at the University of Fort Hare, to be reminded how patriarchy repeatedly rears its ugly head and ultimately through GBV and femicide in our country. It is everywhere. It's in our workplaces, it's in our churches, it's in our communities and sometimes in our families. And upon reflection, I realized that through all my working life in the various places that I've worked, I experienced or witnessed instances of gender inequality at all of them, including UWC. So to set the tone, we would like to have, even though we're not doing the courageous conversation format today, we would like to have a courageous conversation with our panel. And we want to be able to share our stories from our experience. And then at the end, I would ask the, uh, the panelists to share their pearls of wisdom to our young women alumni so that we don't, that we can pave the way forward for each other. So let me tell you one example, my tea incident at the South African Reserve Bank, and it might be familiar to you. So I'm a payment system lawyer and only rep representing the bank in a meeting with um, the commercial banks. As the, as the lawyer for the bank. And one of our administrators came in with a tea and she said, I must please pour the tea for the men. And my response was, why must I pour the tea for the men? What's wrong with them that they can't pour their own tea? For me, it wasn't about the tea, it was about the symbolism attached to having to pour 
having to have an even footing around the boardroom in, um, at the boardroom table and then be expected to pour the tea. Our response was, but you the woman, you pour the tea. And in reflecting about that tea incident, it made me aware of how sometimes we as women, we buy into patriarchy. We sometimes enable it and we don't call it out. Our panelists here today are going to be sharing with you their stories of the challenges um, that they might have experienced, their own perspective, in other words, on the topic of gender equity access and in the changing world of work. Throw into this environment that we find ourselves in at the moment, not only a changing world of work, but the changing world of work within a changing world. And, but what we want to do today is, whilst we are being courageous, we would not want to, the session to be a male bashing session. That's not the intention at all. But we would like it to be a positive session where at the end, all our panelists will be sharing their pearls of wisdom and we would be able to have a conversation hopefully um, through some of the questions that will be coming through on the chat. I will now invite uh, Ms. Lillian Barnard to give her perspective. Thank you. Prof. Lavec and uh, Nevin Marie, uh, to all the young alumni that's on, to the university staff, any distinguished guests who joined us, thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute delight always to partner with UWC, a university that actually gave so much to me. Um, I remember going on the train at the age of 17 just with a suitcase and a dream for my BCom degree. I ended up doing my honors as well. And I actually learned most of my very base leadership skills at this university. I was given an opportunity to be a tutor in the business economics department um, in my third year and in my honors year. So this university is incredibly dear to my heart and it's just fantastic always to partner with you. Now, this topic is very close to me, and I always say that this is my story, and uh, I do not take for granted just the own, my progress that I've made, but I'm also acutely aware that just so many have gone ahead of me. Um, if I just think of where we're finding ourselves in South Africa is that, you know, women are becoming prominent in all spheres of our economy, medicine, law, business, you name it. But still significant progress needs to be made when I think of the technology sector, which is the sector I'm in, the sector I've been in for the last 25 years of my life. And, and women are so significantly underrepresented. So if you look at the stats globally, it will tell you about 20% of top the tech jobs are held globally by women. And um, I don't think it's any different for us locally in, in, in South Africa. And while some gains have been made to narrow the gap, we find that, you know, there's always this conversation that is it, is it a question of, you know, is it the skills? Is it about, you know, um, making sure that, you know, women are not up for these deep, deep technical jobs. But the real difference is starting to happen when we find, when we encourage women to take up these careers. So it's more encouragement that is actually leading to women taking up these careers. And it just tells you that, we need to do more around that. Um, I believe that the business case for change has been made. There are several studies out there that have proven that when you actually have a good balance in gender you know, diversity, you see increased productivity, increased innovation. In fact, you know, the World Economic Forum have had a beautiful study out that says that as we think about our world going forward, we cannot leave our 52% of our workforce in our engines of innovation. If I think of where we are from a technology standpoint, innovation will be at the core of everything we do and we absolutely need women to, to participate. So now as I think just in terms of the role that we need to play as female leaders, you know, who have pretty much, you know, advanced their own careers and what difference we could make. And before I get that, I maybe want to get to what are some of the challenges that I've seen that are actually, you know, keeping women behind. And I will just maybe mention three, right? Um, number one, it's gender stereotypes. I, we have to make sure that we eradicate these stereotypes. 
this whole notion around that, you know, men are seen as the default leaders. Um, when people often think about leadership, and this is also something that was highlighted in the Catalyst study, you know, um, where they talk about, you know, men are seen to be taken charge and women are seen to be taken care. So we have to make sure that we stop boxing women into a certain narrative. Uh, the second one for me that I see as a challenge is the lack of sponsorship. And I've seen throughout my career that often we talk about women in the context of mentorship, which is great, but sponsorship is fundamental because when you have a career sponsor, this individual will champion your career at crucial points and literally help you get to the next level because it's all about accelerating and advancing your career and making sure that ultimately you get to the pinnacle of what you're hoping uh, to get. And maybe the third one also for me, which I have seen is that sometimes women lack confidence, lack confidence to, to ask for some of these big jobs or confidence to go after, you know, the big opportunities and sometimes just confidence to, to speak up in a room. So when I think of some, you know, the role that we need to play as female leaders who've traveled quite a bit in this journey, for me, it's all about paying forward. And one of the things that we can do is being intentional about being a strong role model and making sure that we continue to lend our voice to women so that women feel seen. Because it's very difficult when, you, as you progress your career, and especially when you're very young, for you to be seen in a room. Number two is the point around sponsorship. Sponsor careers open up opportunities for other women. And then mentorship. Mentorship is fundamental. It's about making sure that we mentor the next generation of young women so that we can help them ultimately take up, you know, some of these jobs, uh, you know, in tech, because mentorship is really just a beautiful way for you to kind of accelerate your own career, learning from someone else's experience. And also when you kind of have a very structured mentorship arrangement, it's just amazing what that can do for your life. And I often say this, you know, on many platforms that uh, I am the direct, you know, beneficiary of mentorship because so many people have actually aided my journey. Back to you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for that initial uh, input. I'm looking forward to the, the polls of wisdom later. The next speaker will be Ms. Ilham Grunewald. Over to you, Ilham. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Lavak, and uh, thank you to UWC for this invitation. Similar to Ms. Barnard, I have a very rich history with the University of the Western Cape. I spent more than two decades of my life there. We don't have time um, for you, uh, for me to share my journey, but I, I think it's very important that I just note that my first job at UWC was an unpaid job for three months. I ended up working for Dr. Vincent Mapai in the political science department. I had no offer. I walked after the gentleman and I told him that I wanted to come and work for you. And the rest is history. So very, very special um, story there on my part as well. So I think that in sports specifically, we have achieved much, in, particularly in the recent history um, and on the playing fields. We've celebrated Banyana Banyana, participating in its first World Cup in 2019. We experienced Cricket South Africa announcing a complete overall of professional contracts for our women's team. Uh, recently, uh, football appointed its first female chief operating officer. We are hosting the 2023 Netball World Cup. And of course, our two medalists of Tokyo 2020 for the Olympics are women. <clears throat> so this means that, that, that we, we are making progress. But the reality is we remain very un underrepresented. In the higher education sport environment specifically, we have more than 30 members of University Sports South Africa, but only about five of us are heading up uh, the different uh, sport departments. Now that's a very, very uh, small number. So I agree with you, Prof. Lavak, even in the university environments, where we have these wonderful bright minds <clears throat> that we attract to the university, that we allow uh, to graduate, you know, with top, top class achievements, we're still not making adequate provision for them at various levels. And I think that now with the impact of COVID-19, the stakes are even higher. If we look at the impact, women are at the forefront of caring for everyone. Now, I don't even want to unpack 
the, the very negative impact that COVID had. You know, in the last couple of months, I must have received over 30, 40 CVs of people looking for jobs. And that shows you, we, uh, I heard on the news yesterday that we have a 34% unemployment rate in South Africa. And that means women are even worse off. So in the sporting environment, the male dominated space remain. Our top uh, sport organizations, none of them have female CEOs. And like I said, it's only, and I'm not speaking about netball because it's a, it's a female dominated uh, driven sport and it should be that we have a female CEO, but that's about it. Uh, Gymnastics South Africa has a female CEO, but there are reasons for that. And so I think my position here is that we have so much work that we still need to do in the sporting space because in the workplace, the, the, the picture looks very, very bleak as far as I'm concerned. And I know that as organizations, we continue to strive to achieve and work towards gender equity. But I do think that we need to rethink the systems and, and, and we need to challenge the assumptions like, like Ms. Barnard said. And, and we need to make sure that we try and harness the powers of all genders. I think for me, we, we tend to leave men out of the conversations or all genders for that matter, out of the conversations too often uh, and we, we continue to repeat ourselves. A colleague of mine said, we need to make a commitment to each other that we're gonna stop gathering and complaining. We're gonna come together and we're gonna find solutions. And I think that, that's, a, that's a key aspect that, that we need to achieve, not just in sport, but I think in all of the environments. So what are the, some of the challenges that I've experienced? You know, I've sat in many meetings where I will come forward with a brilliant suggestion. And then five minutes later, a male colleague will make the same proposal and it seems like this wow you know I'm, I, I do not shy away I would raise my hand and say and I will say chairperson I've made exactly the same proposal and you've simply ignored me so let's just pause and take a moment it's not about giving credit it's about giving acknowledgement for the contribution because sometimes our voices get lost because we do not raise our hands and say goodness gracious me this needs to stop now you have not seen me in action in a boardroom, um, the, 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 the um, uh, Professor Tyrant Pretorius is my chairperson of the university sports company and he can tell you many stories about my engagement, but that's, that's the negative. But I also wanna share the, the positive in terms of the commitment by board members, by leaders to change the system. A recent one for me is the South African Rugby Union uh, changing their constitution so that they have every representative must bring a woman to the meeting. Now I'm more interested about the results thereof, but I think I'm positive because for us serving on boards and being part of committees, it's part of our work environment. I also think that we, we um, sometimes we, we have the programs in place, uh, Ms. Barnett, but it's not intentional because we keep women on the waiting list for promotion for too long. And I think for me, that's, that's, that's some of the challenges that in my space, uh, I keep on facing these and, and beyond, uh, and we need to move beyond the, the gender diversity. It's, it's also about the language that we use. And I think the, 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 the Center for Creative Leadership made a point to say that they've changed the phrase of inclusion and diversity to diversity and inclusion. And I'm gonna leave it at, this, at that because I want us to think about that. Uh, thank you very much, Prof. Lavak. Thank you very much. Our speaker will be, uh, to give a will be Ms. Nicolette Nail. Thank you, Nicolette. Thank you, Prof. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm really honored to be here today, to be back home, because I see UWC as home. UWC really laid a foundation for for who I am and what I've achieved. When, when I came to UWC from the Cape Flats from Ballon in 1993 to study law, I never dreamed that I would uh, end up working for a global organization. And I also didn't realize how many different avenues law would open up for me beyond just practicing law in courts to working in the international development space. So I have enormous gratitude uh, to UWC 
um, but also for the skills and the political consciousness and my awakening, like Elam, my first job at UWC was at the gender equity unit. There used to be the gender equity unit, that little house. Um, I was working, I coded books there. Um, and I was also very active in the women's movement, Kopenang, at, at UWC in those early 90s. So my, my work and my passion for the issue of gender equality goes way back, and I'm still working in that space. Um, and the challenges we face in South Africa are global challenges, and I encounter that on a, on a day to day basis. And for me, gender equality is not just about treating everyone the same. We don't just want to be treated the same. It's about a transformational component and it's about addressing the structural components and the systemic challenges around equality. And it does require us to take positive steps to actually redress the injustices of the past. And I think we've made a lot of progress. When I started out in 1998 in my first job, in a big corporate law firm in Cape Town, very white law firm that had never hired a candidate attorney from UWC before. The world was a very different place. Um, and I don't think we faced the same challenges maybe that I faced in, in 1998, but I still think we've got a very long way to go. Doors have been opened and we continue to open doors for women, uh, but the challenges are still there. Uh, and I think for me right now, we should be moving away, moving beyond the language of creating a seat at the table for, for women. I'm much more interested in us tipping the table over and recreating a new table that's much more inclusive and transformative. And that recognizes the issue of gender. For me, the issue of gender is intersectional with the issue of race and class and sexual orientation and ableism. Um, so my race and class and my gender interplays with each other. Um, and my blackness can't be divorced from my gender as a woman. And so we have to take an intersectional perspective when we're looking at issues of gender equality and, and discrimination, if we want to engage with true transformation. Because a lot of my experiences in the workplace have been very racialized, as well as uh, patriarchal and misogynistic um, let me, I've got a tea story as well, Vivian. In one of my, my first, first, first job as a candidate attorney at this very big, very white Jewish law firm, where no one knew what UWC was, everyone came from UCT or Stellenbosch. I was a complete outsider in that law firm. It felt like the people that looked like me and that sounded like me and that spoke like me were the messengers in the mailroom and the women who made the tea. Uh, those were the, the people in the law firm that, that looked like me. Um, and I remember going to advocates chambers with my boss at the time, and he would never, ever ask my opinion. I was there to take notes, and he'd even tell me before we went into the room, we don't need to hear from you, you hear to learn. So you don't talk, you just take notes. And when the tea would come around, there'd be this neck movement, not even saying anything. There would just be this movement, like start pouring the tea. Um, and that was a very difficult moment for me as the youngest person in the room, the junior person in the room, and the only black person in the room, um, being expected to pour the tea and not being expected to have any kind of opinion on anything or being asked my opinion on anything. When I qualified, I had to start managing uh, other candidate attorneys. And I was managing uh, a white candidate attorney from Stellenbosch University, who was still very junior. And I was then had a few years of experience. Whenever we'd meet with clients, the clients would always speak and look at him. And I would say, I'm the lawyer that's going to be handling your case. I'll be representing your case when we go to court. Um, this is my candidate attorney who's going to be, who's learning and and they would not look at me, not make eye contact with me. They would always look and answer him as I ask the questions. Um, and so again, that, you know, it knocks your confidence to having to keep, to keep doing that. I think today, like fast forward 20 odd years later, I don't think we see as much of this overt racism or sexism. What we see is much more at the microaggression level. 
Um, it's the more subtle, often it sounds like it's a compliment that someone's giving you, but it's actually derogatory and quite offensive. So the one I get, I work for a, a global foundation based in New York. So my bosses, uh, it's an American foundation with offices around the world. And one of the first times I presented to people in New York, people, I was on a panel with other colleagues, uh, uh, American colleagues, and people came up to me afterwards and kept saying, oh, you're so eloquent, you're so eloquent. Well done, you speak so well. Like we didn't expect you to be able to speak well because you come from Africa. And what could you possibly know in, in, this, in this climate? I get a lot of that um, working within an American organization right now. I've also been told uh, by our Office of Communications when I was presenting to the board, can you please just tone your accent down a bit? You know, the Americans can't always understand you when you speak. And I was like, this is the way I speak. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to do the code switching or try to put on an American accent um, when presenting to the board. And over the years, I think I've been within this global organization for 15 years now. And I now watch out and often share my experience with the younger Black women, particularly coming from the global South to try to open a space around perceptions around those of us that are coming from West Africa or Southern Africa and entering those kinds of spaces. Um, I'm part of the global leadership team now. And there's this perception, you know, Ford Foundation spends a lot of money funding projects in Africa, Latin America and Asia, but very few people in the senior leadership team actually come from the global south. So there's a very global north perspective around how we do our work. And for a long time, people would say, I kept calling this out that, you know, we don't have enough people uh, that actually look like and come from the global south that are making decisions about where the money goes. And often if you were an American person, you will apply for a job that requires global experience. So all the senior leadership a few years ago were very American. Um, and it struck me that why is it that Americans can apply for a job that requires global experience, but a South African won't apply for a job that's, that's uh, global. And this perception that you can't be global if you're coming from, from Africa. And I think that shifted a lot in the foundation. Um, people did tend to roll their eyes at me because in boardroom meetings, I keep, they say, oh, there she goes again with the global south. There she goes again with the global south. At one point I got a, in my performance review, I was told not everything is about the global south and not everything is about gender. And I said, well, actually it is. Uh, our mission is to support work in the global south. And so I'm gonna keep making the points around gender and around how we interact um, on, on these issues. And I think it's hard when you start feeding this narrative about the angry black woman in the room, when you the person that keeps putting up your hand to call out something on gender or to call out something on race. But I found it's become a lot easier for me now because I'm part of that leadership team versus when I was very young and green and new in spaces where I found it very difficult to articulate uh, the challenge um, beyond being very angry. I was very angry, but I didn't always know how to channel that in terms of a solution or a proposal or a recommendation. And so that's become something that I've had to learn over the years. And um, the last thing I'll say is that <laughs> this insider outsider experience that we often navigate, we all navigate that in our workplaces in terms of how do you bring your full self to work. I'm constantly having to navigate being a South African, being very rooted in South Africa, working in a global organization, but also working with, with leadership that's often male, American, white, um, and having to, to make a case that's not always easily understood by people. But it's important that we do it and that we have champions around us. I think that I've had champions, um, sometimes men within the organization, women as well, that have championed my position, have stood with me, 
have said, look, you should go for this job. You know, men apply for jobs all the time, high global positions. Why aren't you doing it? Having that kind of support from leaders within the organization has really been um, life changing for me. And so I think this role that, that senior people play within an institution in terms of supporting younger, younger people, because, you know, we, I came from a space of uh, imposter syndrome, where you're constantly feeling like, do I really belong here? Am I really good enough? When you're already having that in your head, it's very hard to just go for that job or go for that promotion. And that's where the, those uh, senior men and women in the organization also playing that role has been very important to me. Let me stop there, Vivian. Thank you so much. Uh, technology, hey, I, I seem to have lost question for a, a second or two, but thank you very much, uh, Nicolette, for your input. The last speaker uh, will be um, Tracy and, and that uh, Professor Levac, um, uh, the, the communication seems to be breaking up, Prof. Shall, would you like me to pick up? And yes, I would like you, Tracy. Tracy to please to please carry on. Thank you. So, um, Nicolette, you thought your imposter syndrome was debilitating, and uh, I'm with this group of really powerful ladies, and um, and I'm coming in from a very different um, uh, perspective, and that is that. I have experienced, you know, these prejudices and imp the impact of, of them as a recruiter. And interestingly enough, um, my career in recruitment has spanned sort of 10 years in, in Europe and the US, and then the next 10 years in South Africa. So it's another sort of comparison of, um, and then the other thing is when I headed up recruitment at Rand Merchant Bank, um, I then went into graduate recruitment. So I, I like to think that I'm bringing sort of different perspectives, but primarily from a graduate um, level. And I'll focus less on my um, head of role, although my team was, female so uh, we definitely had the we definitely had the um, appropriate diversity uh, from a male female perspective but um, I'll talk about graduates and um, going through the hiring process and the, the many times that I saw the um, so not always unconscious the very uh, open bias in the recruitment processes when it came to you know gender. The, the next thing I want to talk about is for me, the gender thing, it's Women's Month, but for me, the far greater um, and more pressing, and it will increasingly be so, I think, given that people are sort of more open about their sexuality, is the, if we're not getting the male-female thing right, let alone the race thing, let alone all of the others, what about the people who actually choose to identify as, you know, different to what they were born or they, they prefer not to identify? That's a whole new world and talk about sort of an undercurrent there. But let's start with the, um, let's start with where I personally have experienced people coming into a recruitment process that seems fair and where they honestly have not been successful based on, on the gender. Um, the last thing I'll say before I talk through some of these is that my particular frustration, in fact, it infuriates me, is when I call smoke and mirrors. I would rather, you have the prerog prerogative to make decisions about your business, but don't fake it. Be authentic. If you feel like there's a reason why you have to make a decision, you know, gender aside, please don't run fake or don't posture, run fake uh, recruitment processes to be seen to be doing the right thing. It's not fair. So the other thing is, you know, coming in, often I think that 
um, I was, uh, Cindy um, Ross helped me a lot with her sort of opinion. It's something that she's also close, also an alumni. And she was saying, it's all very well to say equal work, equal pay. However, coming in, it's almost as if, I don't know, I find when I have a panel interviewing a, a male um, uh, candidate, it's almost like when it's a female candidate, they've got to sort of prove themselves. It's sort of, it's almost like they're humoring them. So I have to stress, this doesn't happen a lot, but it's happened enough for me to, to say this is not okay. So then the other thing is um, when uh, it's not only at the grad level, but I, I, I've noticed if they're right, if companies are running processes for uh, C-suites or senior um, management uh, and they are, you know, wanting to give uh, racial and, um, and gender um, supposed equal opportunities. Once again, I feel as if the, it's almost as if they will give the opportunity to someone. So I know of a female, um, fabulous, fabulous, dynamic, successful um, lady who then said, I choose to work slightly limited hours, although I will go home in the evening, put the kids to bed and pick up. And even though it was, the sidelining was very obvious, whether it was bonuses or whether it was being taken seriously. So it does happen at all levels. So let me go back to my personal favorite, my passion, graduates. When a young person is coming into a, an organization, where it's extra hard is, how when you see or you ask an uncomfortable question that relates to your gender and how you will cope as a woman when you want the job what do you say are you going to be you know you you're gonna you're gonna accept the abuse um well it all too often and i'll tell you this it's stuck in my mind forever the the time that we were running um uh and this wasn't actually in a previous employer this was something that i um experienced as a coach they were running um, final round interviews for the graduate program. And one of the senior executive, middle-aged white male was, do, was interviewing a young black female. And then I think probably two white males and then one black male. And although the female was uh, the stronger candidate for that role, he, I asked her to come in afterwards and do a motivation around why he could, should take a chance in, on her. Because he said, but I'm sure you're going to just I'll spend two years training you up and then you're going to go off and have babies. And I'm telling you, it's been hard to recover from watching how compromised she was. She, was, she didn't know, just, you know, in any case. So... I will give a few more tips uh, a little later and I'll share one or two more stories. But the, the thing that I also, um, when I was speaking to Niven on the weekend, I don't, I haven't, I can't think, I can't think of a time that I was personally um, sort of marginalized for being a woman. And it made me think, what have I done that it hasn't happened? So mine has been more the experience of, other people. So I'm going to talk about a little bit later, I'm going to talk about why I think that I haven't and hopefully I can help one or two people with that. Thank you very much, Tracy. I'm, I'm listening and we will be taking some questions later. I see there was only one question. So what I suggest we do at this stage, uh, if I think it's probably more for you, Tracy, but maybe any of the others can um, can respond this one question why are recruiters asking women not men about juggling their careers and raising children in interviews that's the one question and Lillian you have a question as people ops in the tech space we struggle so desperately to find female software developers why are women not dominating this space as well and if they are where are they we need more women developers at our company, and that comes from Martin Friedland. So, um, Tracy, do you want to have a go at that, or any of the other panelists around? You know, assisting a balance. They always ask us women, "How are you going to balance?" 
career. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm happy to talk to that. I think that recruiters often don't necessarily ask that. And I think they're less inclined. So for example, I say to um, candidates, don't put your, your gender on. It doesn't, it should not matter. In the US, you would be like, you'd be sued for that. And certainly not your photo, which I mean, come on. So um, I, I think recruiters are less likely to ask, and I'm talking about internal recruiters or agencies, to ask about um, will they cope in this environment or um, how will they, will, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think that the people who ask are actually the line managers. They want, they're so focused on getting the most out of their employees and they see the 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 things that women are seen to take on is going to detract from that so i truly believe it's um i, I truly believe it's them coming it's it's like we're going to hire a woman we need to sort of make sure we've got pro make provisions for them because they'll need to go off and breastfeed let's put a breastfeeding room downstairs I don't know if that answers your question or if anyone else wants Thank to. Thank you. I think it does. Lillian, your, your question the, about the women in tech and the, especially the software developers. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Okay, my, uh, I think my mic is off. So listen, great question. Thank you so much for asking it. To be honest, there are not enough women in some of these very technical uh you know, careers. And one of the things that we've been doing, and I've been talking, and I think especially two years ago, a lot about how do we debunk some of the common myths around women in tech, right? Because there were a few, uh, you know, myths that basically exist. Number one was that what we found was that girls believed that in order for them to go after you know, computer science in these very technical subjects that they had to be computer nerds. And we all now know that that's not true. Um, number two, another, you know, stereotype that's out there is that if you look at the Gen Z generation, a lot of them, when you speak to them, they will tell you, I would love to have a career where I can make a difference. And I'm perhaps not sure when I do follow a career in software development with how that would help me basically follow my dream. But if you look at how technology is literally at the center of innovation today, you can absolutely make a huge difference when you follow this career path. And the other piece is that, you know, I need to be born with an interest in STEM. I need to be born with an interest in technology. And that is why when I made my opening comments, it was to say that we have start, we are starting to see a shift with women taking up these careers because we continue to debunk the myths. And it is more encouragement, right? And showing them literally the path forward and exposing them to role models that is actually causing the change vis-a-vis -vis just sheer capability and true acumen. So there's a lot more that we have to do to make sure that we bring women into these careers. It starts with what we're doing in primary school, what we're doing in high school with them. So by the time they get to university, it's already inculcated in them where they believe that they are capable to absolutely follow these career paths. So, so absolutely right, there's more that we need to do and we need to come together to make sure that we bring more women into these very technical careers. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Lillian. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I just needed to mention that, Tina, maybe there's an opportunity to be engaged in your university, uh, have a woman in program um, in the economic and management sciences faculty. So um, I hope that there are people from the faculty taking note um, of that. Um, I would now like to ask Lillian, uh, we will take some of the other questions later, to, to share some each of you, we start with Lillian, Elena came sequence. Each of you share a few pearls of wisdom to our young women leaders present here today. Good, thank you, Prof. Um, so for me, if I look at it, and, and uh, I actually have, uh, I have a post up on LinkedIn and I think I put it up, I think uh, in March where I shared a bit of my journey and I always say that 
it was always my dream to be captain of the ship, to be CEO of a company. You know, the what, the why, the how, of course, there was a huge 25 years in between, but, but I always had this big dream. So if I think about my own journey and, and what has made a difference, despite all of the challenges that I faced around what everyone has mentioned, you walk into a room, no one sees you, you say something in a meeting, no one hears you. Let me tell you, that often becomes just part of the narrative, right? But the question is truly, how do you overcome? What is my advice for you overcoming? I talk about this one a lot, and that is about having confidence in your capability. That, that you know, that unwavering belief that you feel that you've got what it takes to do the job. It's about asking for those jobs. What I have found more often than not is that women don't apply for the jobs. We don't ask for the jobs. We don't even put it in our development plan to let our managers know that, let me just, you know, make you understand that I've got very big dreams for my life. And I want to let you know, this is truly, truly what I'm aiming for. So have confidence in your ability because if you want to do big things with your career, let me tell you along the way, you will get scared. And then have courage. You know, I, I my first leadership break came at the age of 28 and I got given 30 people to look after. That was literally the beginning of my journey and, 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 and it never really stopped. And I had to find the emotional courage to lead. And it can be very intimidating, but we must remember that fear can incapacitate you, right? And we must know that doubt is a traitor. So just believe in yourself, believe you can go into this room and you can go in and make a difference. Another part that I always share was passion. Be passionate about what you do. It will set you apart. You will burn the midnight oil. You will go the extra mile. You can give 10 people the same job with equal qualifications, but the most passionate person will easily just stand out. Because what do they say about, you know, the journey called the extra mile is still the road less traveled. And I have found that, you know, some of those things that I did, actually, it stood me really in, in good stead. And, and find your deeper sense for being, you know, find your purpose. I remember when I became a leader very early, I, I used to kind of grapple with the question around, okay, what do you do with this power? Because a lot of power is inferred to you when you become a leader. And, I, and this revelation, which is the John Maxwell, Maxwell quote that talks about, you know, your power is to empower. And once you understand that actually what I'm supposed to do with this power, I'm supposed to make sure that I make people better. It is not about me anymore. And in fact, when you do become a leader, it's actually no longer about you, but it is what you can ultimately do for others. And when you wake up with that, sense of conviction and revelation. It's amazing what that will do for your own career, but more importantly, what it will do for the careers of others. Because when you do get into a leadership role, you can truly change the trajectory of others. And for me being a female leader in this role, when you are inside the door and you have a seat at the table and you have a voice, you can actually change the trajectory of just so many. And another piece for me that I now focus on a lot, especially in this role, is about this whole notion of societal impact. It is important that even as we kind of move forward, try and make a difference wherever you are, um, within your company, outside of your company, because we're going to have to think about inclusivity a little bit broader. I know we talk about inclusivity in the context of our company, make sure that everybody has a sense of belonging, but it cannot be done in the absence of what are we going to do for our society, for our communities and for our people. And especially within our context as a country, all of us have to play a very active role when we think about our economic recovery, making sure that we set South Africa you know, on the right path because so many of us are highly vested in you know, making sure that our country you know, do actually very well in the future going forward. And this is just about, you know, a few of my advice. I don't want to dominate the time, but this is just some of the few, you know, pulse of wisdom I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Back to you, Prof. Labek. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Lillian. Uh, Ilaha? Thank you, Prof. Labek. Um, so I think it's very much leadership um, will come with a lot of uncertainty. 
if anybody ever tells you that you need to be 100% ready, that's not true. And that is sometimes where the self-doubt comes in. And I'm going to confess to the people today here that I went through this self-doubt just uh, during the last couple of days. So it happens. Um, the important thing is that you need to stay true to yourself. It's also very important to be intentional about your development. So my first job at University of the Western Cape, it was intentional because I learned so much during the eight years at that department. I was part of a transition, an important tra transition of South Africa. And I think that's the intention that I'm referring to. You have to also look at the multidisciplinary approach. We uh, uh, there's a lot being said about technology and I can tell you how we are lagging behind so much when it comes to technology and sport in South Africa. And I've decided to move into that unknown spaces and I'm learning every single day, but it has to be, there has to be a, a purpose to that. You also need to find people that will, that will back you, your allies, people that will go out there and advance your profile. And sometimes we tend to keep the circle small, but I think we need to make the circle bigger and include everyone that can help you with that. Because at times we are shy um, to give a little bit of credit. And, and when I mean by credit, it's specifically about being authentic, you being yourself and when necessary, give yourself that credit. And I know that as women, we keep on struggling with that all of the time, especially when we're young. Now in sport, we recently changed the profile of our Olympic structure with 66% women, but we don't have enough young people in that boardroom. And that for me is a challenge. But I also noticed that young people don't go out there and find the allies and have people share their stories so that they become part of those boardroom spaces. I also think, you know, for women generally, uh, it's been said that we don't find it easy to speak up perhaps through but I, I, I don't believe in that. I, I think um, Nicolette spoke about at times to, to understand when, when to be quiet, you know, when to have that moments of silence. But when you do come out, make sure that you come with a big bang. And I believe that, uh, uh, you know, we, we sometimes look at giving credit as self-promotion. And, and men are being referred to not bashing men at all, but we know that this is the trend. It's been looked at as confidence where many a times we try to hide in our spaces. I want to go back to, to Lillian's point. Um, I, I, how do I get through life every single day? It's about my passion. It's about my purpose. It's about my principles. And it's about the values. When I struggle with something in life, this is where I go back to. So you need to find your own uh, space that will keep you positive uh, every single day. Thank you very much for, for that opportunity, Prof. Laba. Thank you so much, uh, Ilham. I'm, I'm starting to, to see a pattern um, uh, in the polls of wit wisdom, and hopefully I can string it along at the end. Um, Nicolette? Thanks, Prof. Um, I think Celebrating yourself and how far you've come. Our biggest stumbling block is often our own insecurity in our own potential, like others have also said. So believe in you and dream big. Uh, ask yourself, what would I do if I wasn't afraid? I can relate to Lillian's point about believing in yourself. When I was first offered my first leadership role to run the office in Southern Africa and our Southern Africa operations, I told the president, I'm not ready. Um, it's very rare that you'll find a man saying, I'm not ready when he's being offered a promotion. I was like, I'm not ready. And he was like, I believe in you, you can do this. And then what did I do? I thought, how do I pay this forward? As the door opens for you, you have a duty to keep the door open for others. And we often told there's not enough space for all of us in the room. And we become competitive with each other. Um, it's easy to focus on your own individual survival and your own individual growth, but you have to lose that notion um, that because you struggle to get where you are, everyone else has to struggle. Um, you, we all have a responsibility, really. I have a responsibility to not see other women from this region struggle to make it in a global environment, for example. And, and I think like um, Ilam has said, map out where you want to be and what you want to do. 
What is your positionality now? And are you committed to this organization's mission and vision and goals? Is this your passion point? Because then you can really invest in trying to change the institution, shift the institution. Um, the first law firm I worked at, I knew that was just a pit stop in my career. So I wasn't going to invest a lot of time in trying to change the structure of that organization. That was just a pit stop for me before I, I moved on to another organization. But if you see yourself in an organization and you want to grow in that organization, then I think it's important to invest in some kind of change agenda. Um, and it's okay to be silent sometimes when you, when you don't want to talk or you, uh, you for your own self-preservation. I think we have to talk about the emotional cost of dealing with microaggressions on a daily basis or dealing with issues of racism and sexism. And not every battle has to be your battle to fight. I've often been in a position where everyone you have a meeting and they say, when we go to the leadership we're all going to say this, we're all going to say this, so the whole Africa cohort will come together. And then you find you're the only person speaking and everyone, all your, your comrades are quiet that were outside spurring you on. And then you're like, this wasn't even my idea, like, and now I'm being the spokesperson for this. Um, and I think make yourself indispensable. You do need to prove yourself. Don't kid yourself that you can come in and trust will be there and respect will be there and collegiality will be there. You do have to work on building relationships to build trust and respect. And as you build that, people are much more willing to listen to you. When people didn't know who I was when I said something, no one really cared. As people said, oh, she actually does have something of value to contribute in terms of her work. I could then start addressing the social issues. Because finding your voice does have consequences and speaking truth to power can have consequences and you need to be prepared for those consequences and make a strategic choice that you're going to do this. So pick your battles. Um, building solidarity is important because there's power in shared experience um, and networking is a skill. It's a fine art and skill um, that we don't invest in learning more about how to do your social networking and how to build your network in your career because alliances matter. And I think compromise, the fine line between selling your soul for the sake of climbing the corporate ladder and the reality of your economic situation and your own relative power. I think we need to talk, but be much more clear around, around those kinds of decisions that you weigh up. And um, lastly, I think power, you must do a power analysis of the workspace you enter. You need to ask yourself, how does change happen within this institution? Who gets listened to? Who is silent? Who's invisible? Is this organization receptive to change? Who's driving change? Is it top down? Is it bottom up? Where do I sit within that ecosystem? And which are the battles that I want to take on and who are my allies? Because you have to know what is within the realm of your control. Uh, what you can change There's the serenity prayer that we say, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change and the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to know the difference. And so I think that's important as you, especially when you're junior in an organization which you, that you've just joined to really make that strategic choices and to position yourself. And the last point I'll say is don't kill yourself for your job. I think if I was giving advice to my younger self, I would say self-care is important. Um, I've often sacrificed relationships and friendships for work and I've climbed the ladder very quickly um, and I've gotten lots of accolades in my career, but it has come at a cost. And your job will disappoint you down the line. So be kind to yourself and nurture your whole self, not just your career self, but also your personal life. Um, and that's been a hard lesson for me um, that I try to impart on younger professionals. Don't wake up and it's like, oh my God, I forgot to invest in having children because I was climbing the ladder. And I forgot to invest in spending more time with my family because I was climbing this ladder. 
balance is important. And I come from a generation where that balance was not always emphasized and no one, you were almost embarrassed in a male dominated environment to speak about self care. But the world has changed and organizations now do talk about mental well being and self care and burnout in a way that is uh, much more progressive than it was in the past. But we ourselves often push ourselves to work late at night, work weekends, and to succeed. And that comes at great emotional cost that you need to be aware of. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. That re uh, really resonates with me. Uh, I always quote at UWC, uh, the job is what I do, it's not who I am. <laughs> On the self care. Um, Tracy, uh, you, you get to uh, share your pearls of wisdom if, before I. Uh, if you can also, the panelists, look at the chat. There are uh, two or three questions that we'll uh, briefly deal with, and then I'll try and string these pearls along. Okay, thank you. I have to say, Miss Barnard inspires me because not only does she talk about her journey, she's kind of proved it. She's, I mean, this is great inspiration, as in, you know, the case of Ilham and, um, and Nicolette. And Nicolette, I think you and I could talk for a long time about this because we have such similar views. The only thing, like I was saying to the panel earlier, is this, so Nicolette, I believe what you're saying now is absolutely correct. And I do think it's why I never really allowed myself to feel it. I mean, you can see I'm outspoken. I call a spade a spade. And if someone said, pour the tea, I'd be like, uh, you know, you pour the tea. Um, but when they're young, and then there was that, that comment about um, rural kids. And then there was also the, the thing where um, into, you know, more traditional um uh, countries, families, and to the rest of Africa, there's that ingrains. How does somebody, and I wish I could uh, give the pearl of wisdom, how does a young graduate wanting a job, being faced with um, discrimination, like at what point do they compromise? Do they, fair enough, I so agree with you, Nicolette. I do think we need to take responsibility for it. We can't just sit back and um, and allow it to have, we've got to prove ourselves. We've got to prove ourselves no matter what it is. But at what point is um, pushing to prove that we are actually worthy um, compromising your, um, actually, do I want to work for an environment like this? So, I mean, my, my fellow panelists, please share some pearls of wisdom with me too, that I can then pass on to the people that I coach. All right. Thank you very much, Tracy. Um, we, I'm hoping that beyond today, you will still all be connecting with each other so that even if we, we're not managing to to do all the polls now, we can definitely uh, then do it offline. Um, I see there are some questions. The, the one was for Ilham. Um, has any research been conducted looking at barriers of female referees or officials in football at the national level? And why are we not seeing more female referees in national level matches? That is for Ilham. If, if you can very briefly, Ilham, um, mentioned that there's a lot of, um, while she's thinking of a response, there is probably for Lillian. I really enjoyed this, this comes from Kitumetse. Um, I will have, a, okay, I thank all the panelists and um, it is about the rural kids. How do we then look at rural child female who has limited access to education and te technology and how can we assist them, Lillian? Yeah. I think I'm gonna take those two questions um, because the others are comments that I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging the panelists to please look at the chat for the congratulations that are also um, extended to you before I round up. Okay. Yelham, you want to go first? Yes, thank you, Lalia. Um, I'm not aware of any research because if there was research done, the intent to change the landscape uh, would have been better. So, but research generally in sport in South Africa, there's, there's a big void. Um, and so if we look at um, women in, in all spheres of sport, the policy is missing. 
investment is missing. People always say there's not enough money. So if you ask any sport federation, and it's true, they say that there's no money. So we conduct a lot of uh, training opportunities. Now I'm going to uh, speak from a Western Cape point of view. I know that South of Western Cape does a lot in that field. And so I'm not going to say that nothing has been done, but usually we take our experience and experiences from what we see on television. And what we're currently seeing on television, I don't think it's enough. I alluded to it right at the beginning with my introduction to say that a lot has happened, but not enough, specifically in the fields where we need more to be done. So I don't believe that uh, uh, appropriate research has been conducted so that we can advance the space um, for, for female referees, specifically at a higher level. <clears throat> Thank you, Prof. Lavak. Good. Thank so, you so much, Johan. Um, Lillian, you can go and attempt that is a quite a big question you got. <laughs> yeah, it's a, it's a very broad question. And, and to be honest, it is a question that we do get every day. And it is something we are focusing on and concerned about. But, you know, this is the beauty of digital. It gives us the opportunity literally to get to everybody, the opportunity to empower literally every person. So, so rural is a concern. We've got a lot of initiatives um, as Microsoft to make sure that we even get to far-flung areas. And it gives me great delight we, uh, to let you know that we've announced um, just last week, uh, Thursday, an initiative with the uh, Eastern Cape Provincial Government, and we call it the Digital Innovation Hubs. One of the key challenges we have in uh, our rural communities is always connectivity because, because this is the beginning of the digital journey, right? It's connectivity. And what we're now doing is that we are rolling out a you know, countrywide initiative with every single province. And what we bring together is to say, how are we going to accelerate digital literacy from basic all the way down to deep technical because all of these things exist it's about getting it to the people but we need to work jointly with government and some other private partnerships to make sure we get to our rural community it's something that's top on my agenda for example we did a uh, project in Limpopo and one of my team members are on Vivian Lunda and Ashish is already sending a link and we did a project in Limpopo you know trying to get to rural schools and make sure that we also give you know, children in our real communities their digital experience. The reality as such is that we need to do this faster. We need to get much further than we do right now. But the beauty is that it's a focus area and there is an opportunity literally for us to level the playing field between our rural communities and our urban communities. We are also striking partnerships with, for example, the mines, because we know that the mines are in our rural communities, they are entrenched. They also kind of focus very deeply on what they would like to do for um, you know, their rural communities. We partner with them, giving them our technology. They then go and roll it out. Our universities is a big, big, big one that Vivian just also uh, mentioned. And uh, we will continue to partner with universities to make sure that we start empowering not just the universities, but literally get to every single school from urban all the way down to rural. And I know it's not just a focus for Microsoft, but a, a, you know, a focus for many technology companies across the board. Um, back to you, Prof. Lavik. Thank you so much. Sorry, I slipped that in because I thought there's, uh, we are also focusing as a University of the Western Cape, it's one of my focus areas around digital inclusion and the digital uh, uh, social uh, uh, through our zone so learning at UWC in an incubation space. So there's wonderful things that one could talk about. But as you're all talking, now I want you to imagine a string of pearls because I was, look, I was listening to you from the perspective of, of stringing this in a, a string of pearls. So I listened to your words. And this necklace is now made up of the following. And this I, I then dedicate to all, all the people that are this webinar. Confidence, courage, passion, empowering, impact, intentional, multidisciplinary, network, purpose, principles, believing, sharing, 
commitment, silence, indispensable, trust, respect, voice, strategic, compromise, power analysis, self-care. There was quite a mouthful in today's session and, and, um, and that is why I, I, I listened to, to your words. And I'm actually hoping, uh, Niven, um, in thanking if every one of you as the panelists, um, Lillian, Neil Harm, Nicolette and Tracy for your not only wonderful input, but really insightful input um, into this topic that one can probably, I would suggest, Nervin, another session where, where we can have more questions, um, uh, you know, taking, taking forward these, these perspectives and especially the pearls of wisdom that were shared today. I, for, for one, found it so valuable. And I think someone on the chat also said that it's lovely sometimes to hear that what you're experiencing, it's not just you, but you're experiencing your experience is authentic. There's someone else that has a similar experience. And that sharing. If I were to say, how does one then make this not a, a, a talk shop? I will be carefully thinking through from each of our perspectives. How do I take today and do something practical? And that is why I spoke about partnerships at the end. Because I do believe that... Um, we cannot, if, if we want to tackle a societal issue and we all want to have a social impact, then we need to do it from the government to public sector, private sector, the community itself needs to be involved. That's quite important. And we as universities have a central role as the almost a person or uh, an institution that can bring all these role players to, uh, together. So I want to thank each and every one of you on behalf of UWC and also to say thank you to Niven for set and his team for setting this up. It's been an absolute pleasure to be the moderator here today. I've learned a lot and that is the wonder about this journey is that um, you, you sometimes reach a level of what they call um, unconscious um, competence where sometimes you forget what you already know um, and when you start, you don't even know what you don't know. So there's, a, there's, a, there's value in hearing um, other women such as yourself speak. And um, I have been very inspired and encouraged by the session today. So thank you so much. And I wish all of you uh, a wonderful Women's Month. And uh, of course, women's, uh, it's not the only month where we should be sh uh, celebrating women. So in conclusion, I would like to leave us with a quote from um, Michelle Obama on, on change. She said the following, change is a direct smooth path. There's going to be bumps and resistance. There's been a status quo in terms of the way women have been treated what the expectations have been in the society, and that is changing. There's going to be a little upheaval, a little discomfort, but I think it is up to the women out there to say, sorry, sorry that you feel uncomfortable. That is something to ponder on uh, Michelle's wise, wise words that it is okay and that we say sorry that sometimes we make you uncomfortable. Um, with those few words and with this experience, I would invite you before you leave to just um, have a look at the chat, especially the panelists and, um, and see some of the comments for, for your own noting. And thank you so much, everyone. Professor thank Levac, you. thank you very, very, very much, um, Professor Levac. Lillian, Nicolette, Ilam, Tracy, thank you very much for, for invading yourselves. Uh, today, it's, it, uh, as they would say, a kreis skoen wunner place. It's, um, 
it's 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 really an honor and, and an absolute pleasure to have been a part of this. And I think Nicolette, for me, you, the, the one term that you that you you made reference to is alliances. And 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 from the alumni relations division, um, you know, that is our our core focus is to be able to the, to develop the long-term alliances amongst our alumni population and community. And Prof, you can bet your bottom dollar, this is, this is the first, this is certainly not the last, that these conversations or such conversations will be, will be embarked upon. And we, you know, as the alumni relations team, we would be honored to host each and every single one of our speakers individually, um, because I think um, you, you all come with uh, 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 such an in-depth wealth and breadth of, of knowledge and expertise and, and experience um, that we'd be able to contribute and, um, to our, our broader alumni community. So with that, um, and on behalf of my team, and I'd like to invite each of my, my team members to switch on their cameras because this has not just been Niven. Niven has merely just been a an actor, um, Sumaya, uh, Najma, Selo, Avril. Um, these are the people that make alumni relations stick at UWC. Um, and, and, and I need to commend my team for the work that they have put into, into this um, for the entire series and, and, and taking alumni relations forward at UWC. Um, I'm absolutely honored to have you know my 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 team around me um, and 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 wonderful alumni and partners and Professor Levac to you um, as an executive member at at UWC we are absolutely um, enthused at the prospect of where we can go with this so thank you very much to to each and every single one of you for participating and for all our attendees thank you very much for taking the time and being with us today. Thank you. Thank you.